Hello and welcome to Armenian News Network Room, Week in Review for Sunday, December 6, 2020. I'm Ovik Manacharyan, and together with Aspet Bedrosyan, we'll be talking to our guests about the following major topics. Turkey and Azerbaijan connecting. Armenia's political opposition uniting. Support from Russia. And Robert Kocharyan's interview. To talk about these issues, we have with us Varujan Geramyan, who is assistant professor at Yerevan State University and teaches on Turkey's modern history and the history of Azerbaijan. And Aspet Kochikian, a lecturer of political science and international relations at Bentley University in Massachusetts, where he teaches courses on the Middle East and former Soviet space. This episode was recorded on Sunday, December 6. Hello and welcome everyone. Let's directly jump to our questions. So in the statement of November 10, it looked like the point number 9 was a late addition, which Turkey and Azerbaijan decided in a moment when Armenia was at gunpoint and out of options, they would throw in everything in the kitchen sink in the agreement. It reads as follows. All economic activity and transport links in the region are to be unrestricted. The Republic of Armenia guarantees the safety of transport links between western regions of the Republic of Azerbaijan and the Nakhichevan Autonomous Republic in order to organize the unimpeded movement of citizens, vehicles, and cargo in both directions. Transport control is carried out by the body of the border service of the FSB of Russia. By agreement of the parties, the construction of the new infrastructure linking the Nakhichevan Autonomous Republic with regions of Azerbaijan is to take place. Varujan, can we take a moment to talk about the goals of this point and any major uh, issues that you see? Okay, Ovik, thank you. Uh, well, uh, as I said, um, I think that uh, this point was not added at the last uh, moment uh, because uh, this is one of the main goals of both Azerbaijan and Turkey for the last uh, decade at least, and they were promoting this idea very actively. Of course, we were not talking about that publicly, but we were sure and we have seen so many evidences uh, when Turkey, especially Turkey, was putting this idea uh, on the front line. Uh, so this was one of the main instruments to pressure Armenia. And uh, at the moment where the Arme- when the Armenian government was not ready at all to any, uh, any diplomatic uh, negotiations, and they were absolutely ready to any kind of agreement to sign, uh, which we have uh, actually seen uh, on, uh, on, on, on the paper. At that moment, they used also this instrument. But to use this instrument, uh, there was a kind of a, well, let's say, very, uh, in uh, brackets, very pro Armenian um, point there. It is the, that the all roads in the region should be opened, though now no clarification what kind of roads and what uh, does it, uh, whether it's, it's about Armenian Turkish border, for example, or it's only about Armenia and Azerbaijan, or only about uh, Nagorno Karabakh or Artsakh and Azerbaijan. So no clarification, but still in this environment, in these frames where when the roads are going to be opened, and this is clearly, uh, uh, it, it looks like an pro-Armenian point, in these pro in the frames of this pro-Armenian, so-called pro-Armenian point, Azerbaijan and Turkey imposed very anti-Armenian and very dangerous for Armenia point. Uh, it is the corridor, so-called corridor, or the linkage or, uh, or connection road between Nakhichevan and Western Azerbaijan. Uh, by the way, I would like to stress also another uh, uh, lack of uh, clarification in this point because there is no, mm, uh, it, it says that there should be connection between Nakhijevan and Western Azerbaijan regions, though uh, we are not sure uh, whether it's going to be only one road or it should be more. Of course, we think that the first and the easiest way is to provide connection through Sunik and through Meri, because also we have seen that this point was there uh, starting from 1990s. But uh, who says that Azerbaijan will not also demand uh, another uh, connection between, for example, Ghazakh region and Nakhijevan through Vayozdor, which is also a connection like in the middle between Western Azerbaijan and Nakhijevan. Yeah, and especially the document uh, uses the plural word links. I, absolutely, this is this is what I say. I mean, there is clearly like 
uh, it looks like there is a, a pro-Armenian point about the communications and we have seen that the uh, government of Armenia now uh, highly let's say uh, stress this the importance of this point it uh, they they try to present the, this as a, a great achievement of an army of Armenian diplomacy and a possibility to use the region's connections roads uh, and other infrastructure to strengthen Armenia's economy which is absolutely uh, um, not right and at least it's it, it is very naive to talk about this kind of thing but still uh, in this frame Azerbaijan and Turkey got much more and the corridor if you are uh, familiar with the um, geopol- the general geopolitical uh, logic of the region it is something that really strengthened uh, uh, Azerbaijan strengthened uh, Turkey and the general uh, balance of power in the region is turned towards towards Turkey one thing, if I may, uh, if I may add, I think my reading of the uh, oil and transport links the plural. I think, in a way, there is a, a mentality, or there is a thought that uh, probably considering Lachin as also as transport and uh, transport link uh, is included in that. Um, I'm not sure if the interpretation will end up being that. So the plural links can be applied to all the existing links, but all, also the ones that would be created. So both uh, the railway link and so on, uh, and, and other new roads or other links that might be created. And the second thing that not a lot of people pay attention to is that this uh, link between Nakhichevan Autonomous Region Region and the rest of Azerbaijan proper is something that has been uh, sort of circulating or has been in in the in the works, if you want to call it, uh, back in early 2000 with the Gobel plan, uh, where actually very interestingly, back in early this year, uh, as early as February, March, and even as late as June, that uh, Gobel plan started circulating again. So it's not a last minute addition, definitely, but it is uh, an addition. Uh, taking advantage of the weak position that Armenia was in during the uh, sort of signing of the agreement. Yeah, I would like to add, if I may, um, if we look at the pro-government media experts uh, and all other, all all those who are in a way circulating the ideas, which are popular among the Turkish establishment, uh, Turkish government, uh, uh, political and military leadership. Uh, then we can clearly say that now there are uh, very big preparations uh, 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 to uh, to be prepared for the, for this uh, corridor, so called corridor through Sunik, and uh, unfortunately for us, this is not only about a simple road as one of the representatives of Armenian government uh, said uh, uh, recently. Uh, This is about really a huge uh, communication infrastructure which is going to connect uh, Nakhijevan to to former Zangilan region, the occupied part of Artsakh. And uh, this road is going to have at least... um, Besides, besides uh, a road, there there should be a train line. There should be a pipeline, uh, which is going to connect Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. And there are already some agreements being, um, not agreements, some, some discussions and negotiations between three sides. So clearly, we have see we can see here um, uh, preparations for a very uh, huge geopolitical presence in Sunni. And uh, if we look uh, uh, for a midterm result, we can say that um, in 10 years or in 20 years, um, Turkey can or and Azerbaijan can uh, bring another um, another um, of, uh, evidence that this is uh, of critical importance for Turkey and Azerbaijan. We have pipeline here, we have a road here, we have train here. So we should keep it by ourselves and not letting Armenia or another third part like Russia to decide the future or to secure the protection of this uh, of these communications. So this is absolutely very dangerous thing for Armenia. And uh, unfortunately, I can say that cur- currently we don't really see the, uh, the scale of this project, the scale of the uh, Azeri and Turkish preparations. 
So uh, I have actually a question about, you know, how opposed to this was Pashinyan? Because uh, I just have in front of me an article he wrote in 2001 uh, entitled t- titled Menk Umer Shahera, where he criticized Robert Kocharyan in general for even considering this, uh, this global plan. But in the same article, uh, he mentions that, you know, may- maybe we should be open to the idea of connecting to Turkey to Azerbaijan and opening up transport links. And we should not be so pro-Russia in, or- in order to sort of impede this plan. So actually, I'm wondering... How much uh, Pashinyan inside was was really against this plan? Uh, because at least w- how it's phrased today, it seems uh, very much to what uh, you know, similar to what he wrote about in 2001. Look, I think uh, Hovik, I think one of the things to keep in mind, and this is true for any any kind of a political actor who are looking from outside to in, inside, uh, from outside to in, is that they actually might not have all the details and do not have the understanding of the weight of uh, making political decisions. That doesn't exclude the fact that uh, one person might be ideologically or politically inclined to take certain action versus another. But um, at the time, it wasn't brought up publicly. It wasn't brought up now. But the fascinating thing, as I said, is that as early as this year and as late as June, the, suddenly in the Armenian media, this topic started circulating and no one paid attention to it. You know, the, the variations are different. Barujan is correct in terms of, you know, the method or the mechanisms or the type of connection will, will be multiple fold. You know, in earlier, one of the options that especially Goebbels plan, uh, which was completely to see territory, but uh, and one of the variation was to build a bridge connecting nothing. Uh, uh, with Azerbaijan proper. Now it's all talking about more than that. So from this perspective, I think um, I think it was the last moment. I I, I believe that had there been a, a serious negotiation back in October, early October, this issue would not have been imposed. At this point, it was truly a, a, a gun to the head, and they would have accepted everything that was on the ground. And I wouldn't have uh, been surprised had the Russians didn't intervene. Uh, you know, one of the requirements would have been to bring back all our, uh, all of uh, nagorno karabakh autonomous oblast in its borders under Azerbaijani control. So... It's not about just uh, how no one was ready for this. Uh, no one was even uh, able to uh, understand the uh, the implications of this. And uh, this is in no way justifies uh, well, what was signed. But I don't think that, you know, what someone said 10 years ago or eight years ago or nine years ago when they were in opposition, uh, a minor opposition, whatever they write, they have actually a complete understanding of the reality on the ground. Uh, I would like to bring an example of 2000 and. Eight, when there was a high uh, discussion, there were high discussions about the possibility of Armenian-Turkish reconciliation. If you remember the football diplomacy, so-called, um, I was in a way participating to the process, being though I being a student uh, back then, but still I clearly remember that there was uh, t- there were tense discussions about the. Uh, pros and cons for the Armenian side and one of the main points that the opposition was trying to bring uh, to the attention um, was uh, the real economic gains of Armenia uh, if the Armenian-Turkish border uh, was opened. And um, I remember that no clear uh, research or clear uh, analysis of the possibilities and opportunities for Armenia was uh, conducted back then. Um, though the the connection between Armenia and Turkey looks like uh, looks like a very good thing, let's say. Uh, now, if we talk about the uh, economic uh, uh, gains of Armenia, it's much more the, the difficult and complex situation than back in to, uh, 2008, uh, because you, you, you know what happened. Let's say, and Armenia is not the one, uh, the the country which uh, can bring to to the attention uh, uh, its own interests currently, unfortunately, especially with this government. So this is one 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 point. 
Uh, another point is that, and answering to your question, Hovik, um, I, I would like to say that um, uh, there is no real need to discuss and try to analyze what uh, uh, the Prime Minister is uh, uh, thinking about the current situation, about the possibilities, etc. Because uh, now it is absolutely clear for everyone that he is not uh, really understanding the situation. He is not very well prepared. He was not very well prepared, and uh, unfortunately, during these two and a half years, he is not prepared at all. And uh, he is not the the guy who is uh, really familiar with the ev with every detail of of the Nagorno Karabakh problem in general. I'm not talking about the Artsakh Armenians. I'm not talking about Artsakh, but the Nagorno-Karabakh problem as a geopolit geopolitical um, complex uh, in this region, which is connected with Iran, which is connected with Turkey, with Russia, with even China and the Middle East in general. Uh, I clearly remember when I was in, 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 in uh, summer, I was talking about the uh, jihadists and uh, change of Turkish narrative towards Armenia and towards Nagorno-Karabakh problem and the preparations in Turkey. So several times I got from the government the clear answer. Uh, this is a clear exaggeration of the situation. Turkey is not going to be part of this process. This is about Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, which shows that there is no <laughs> real and uh, correct understanding of the situation. And this brought to this situation. Th that's why uh, now and uh, the, gover the steps taken by government and the politics and the uh, policies undertaken by our government, unfortunately, are very... Um, uh, not very deep, market Sain. I don't know the correct word for 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 for, for that in English. But superficial. No, yeah, very superficial. Uh, so this is this is the result of this superficial um, approach to every problem we have, uh, and um, I can unfortunately I can I, I should underline that. Uh, this is unprecedented situation for us, both from the perspective of geopolitics, both for, from the perspective and, and from the perspective of sovereignty. All right, let's let's go to the political environment inside the country now. So, since uh, the end of the hostilities uh, on November 9th, uh, when the statement was signed, there has been a lot of turmoil in Armenia. A hodgepodge of 17 uh, or more political parties, calling itself uh, now, I guess, called the Salvation of Motherland Movement has called for uh, Pashinyan's resignation and has put forward the veteran politician Vazgen Manukyan as its candidate for interim PM. On Saturday, December 5, the alliance held the largest protests yet in four weeks, numbering about 20,000 people, according to who you ask. Uh, meanwhile, the only, I, think, I guess, the only other parliamentary opposition party, uh, Edmond Marukyan's Bright Armenia Party, also announced uh, their candidacy, which is Edmond Marukyan, surprise. The position itself is not vacant, though. Pashinyan has refused to comply with the calls for resignation, and the government uh, has only made cosmetic changes by reshuffling the cabinet and its advisors. Varujan, where do you see these developments heading? Well, Hovik, I'm not a specialist of, of Armenian uh, politics at all, uh, and uh, usually I refuse to answer and to comment on everything which is happening inside Armenia. One thing I can say as, as a simple, like or an ordinary citizen uh, and um, a, a person who lost his home uh, and part of his homeland, uh, I can say that uh, unfortunately the government is not, uh, again, it, it, it didn't realize what happened. It didn't realize uh, the, the difficulty to rebuild Armenia. And it currently <laughs> uh, doesn't realize at all because each of, with each day we are uh, losing another opportunity to rebuild faster than we can. Another important thing is that uh, all the elite which is uh, there and uh, which is uh, pronouncing, which is declaring its own understanding of the things, it's totally gone out of control of uh, prime minister and uh, p part of the uh, both b okay let's say uh, universities academia uh, intelligentsia so called students 
and all the uh, all other segments of society, all other uh, parts of society, which are in a way connected with Artsakh as a political symbol. They are clearly mm, demanding the resignation of the prime minister and his cabinet. So in a way, this is the first ever political movement in Armenia. This is not a socio-economic movement right now happening in Armenia. Uh, yesterday I was there at, at uh, Liberty Square, at Opera, uh, and I have seen that there is no... I haven't seen anybody who was there before when there was a, a meeting for um, or rally for, uh, electricity prices for gas prices or anything like that. So no, no socioeconomic background behind this thing. So currently this is totally political thing. And if uh, there is no resignation uh, of the cabinet and prime minister himself, then in two or three months to this political movement, we should add also socioeconomic because the things are going in this direction, unfortunately. And then we'll have really a massive uh, movement uh, against uh, ruling elite and ruling uh, team. And then, of course, it will be much more difficult for Pashinyan to stand or to keep its power. I would add to what, yeah, I would I would like to uh, provide an analysis, and I would disagree with Varujan on one thing, that just because you're not a specialist, you're a social scientist, Varujan, and obviously your perspective is uh, the fact that you're living, uh, you're underground, it provides a valuable insight, so you shouldn't sell yourself short on that. Um, now, uh, the thing is, uh, a couple of things here. Uh, it is true that this is more of a, a nationalist uh, movement, national movement, rather than sociopolitical, a socioeconomic one. It is a national political movement, uh, rallies. And uh, obviously, when it comes to rallies, we look at the the basically the scorecard for the last uh, seven, eight, nine years in Armenia. You see different people uh, coming up to different rallies, so they have their target audience. Uh, however, uh, it is true that the, the current opposition putting forward their own candidate at Vasquez Manukyan, honestly, I don't, I couldn't see anything that they could offer, anything tangible that they offered. It's very hypothetical in terms of what they want to achieve. I find it interesting that they're saying that whoever is going to be the transitional prime minister or the government head of the government will not stand uh, to run in the elections. But uh, knowing politics and uh, the nature of politics. Um, you know, I'm not sure that would be also true uh, in terms of Vasya Manukyan saying that, OK, I did my job and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, there is a silent majority that are in shock or indifferent. And that's why we don't see the numbers increasing. Add to this the fact that the opposition itself um is self, uh, you know, the, you know, single-handedly and basically self-inflictingly, uh, they declared that they're going to uh, have the next rally in a couple of days, just thus breaking their uh, momentum. So I'm not sure if the rallies are going to have the impact that they want it to happen. Um, meanwhile, uh, the two parliamentary opposition parties, one of them is joining this group, uh, the Barka Bajayastan, whereas the Lusabur Hayastan, Bright Armenia, is trying to work from within. Um, and to this, I think there is a factor that one needs to uh, consider, and that is the rate of attrition of parliamentarians in the majority faction. And it's not as high as one would expect or one would hope for to have a major change. So, Aspet, how is the martial law affecting this, maybe? <clears throat> well, the martial law is not affecting because the uh, administrative court in Yerevan, in Armenia, decided that because of the martial law, that doesn't mean that they cannot uh, be rallied. So that is not an issue at all. Uh, the martial law is being implemented in other cases, but in terms of the law on rally... All points of the martial law has been have been removed, e even, but the only thing that remains is the martial law itself, which and the only benefit it provides is that the government cannot resign during a martial law. I wouldn't say that, Hovik. I think there are a couple of other things about the martial law. For instance, uh, young adults... 
uh, male adults cannot leave the country unless no, they th- get that, a, that, that restriction has been lifted. Yeah, yeah, they changed it. They changed it. Yeah, okay. the, the only thing Hobbik is correct. The only thing which is right now on place is the possibility, okay. yeah, or the lack of possibility to change the government. Right. Unless there would be a constitutional change, right? Unless there is a constitutional mechanism in which the parliament uh, withdraws its uh, support. They uh, can't do of- that. They can't do that because of martial law. So, so that means the martial law has to come down before there are any resignations. Absolutely. Exactly. And may- maybe that was why until Tuesday uh, was given, because uh, there needs to be some parliamentary activity before uh, Pashinyan resigns himself. Uh, no, but until Tuesday then, the question would be until Tuesday if they, the, the parliament would remove the, the martial law, which would open the door for others. But the way things are going, as I said, because of the rate of attrition or the lack of, I don't see that happening anytime soon. And I'm, I'm worried that, again, because of the weather, I think, and because of the malaise, I think we have to realize that Armenia today is not the Armenia of 1989, 1991, right? When people would take on the streets. I mean, the national fervor or the, the sense of national uh, demand was much, much higher. The sense of national unity, not, not the national unity, but the sense of national uh, uh, sort of interest were much, much higher than today. Let me, let me ask you this, actually, uh, and I'll let Varujan talk, but Varujan, while you respond to that, maybe also uh, address uh, if the opposition, let's say, achieves success, what can they change specifically maybe, let's say, regarding point number nine that we previously talked about? Or what would you change, for instance, if you were if you suddenly came to power? This is a question to me? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frankly, I would not, not like to be a part of any government right now because it's too <laughs> difficult to take the responsibility. It's really very difficult and anybody who is claiming that he can do that then he is in a way kamikaze uh, which or is ignorant ready. not just a kamikaze Varujan, also oh, okay ignorant, probably okay. <laughs> i'm I, i'm talking about normal people <laughs> oh, okay. uh, so uh, yeah but okay coming back to your question uh well first of all i would like to bring two more clarifications to what aspect said even in uh, even two years ago in in april, april during the protests uh, the highest number of people which were participating in the in the movement before uh, president sarkisian's uh, resignation was nearly 60 65000 and yesterday it, the number was nearly 20000 so it's not that much different uh, and in the beginning of the protests, uh, the number of people participating to uh, Pashinyan's uh, protests were uh, not uh, more than 5,000 or 7,000, 7, like something like this. So we can see clearly the uh, uh, some rise in the uh, in, in numbers of participants, uh, especially with each uh, new problematic issue which is coming out, like uh, the, uh, the, the 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 problem of Sotk or the problem right now with Sunik in in Rapan and in in Goris region where the villages are being protected, not by the government but the villagers themselves. So these kind of things are clearly not in favor of Pashinyan and the peop- and people are standing because they have already, if uh, two weeks ago, uh, a person from Gumri, if uh, he hasn't any uh, soldier on the front line, he can be far from the Artsakh issue in a way. But when he has, uh, now he, he uh, hears about Goris, which is not like something like Martakert or Kovsakan, but it's very, he is very familiar with this uh, toponym. He says, okay, Goris, oh, this is about already Armenia. This is not about Artsakh at all. So people are, uh, in a way, they are opening their eyes and they see the clear dangers towards the Republic of Armenia. So this can bring, again, uh, some uh, more numbers to protests. And the second thing, which is also important to say that, uh, the, unfortunately, I'm saying this very, with, uh, no, I'm not happy with this. Um, the government is not ready to talk and c- communicate the reality to the people. Uh, they haven't uh, showed any f- till this day from November 10. No map of the real situation in Artsakh. No map. We have only Russian maps. 
or Azerbaijani maps. No map prepared by the Armenian government. And because of this decision, for example, all my uh, my family and my friends and uh, everybody I know from my city, from Berzor, we are not sure whether Berzor can be inhabited by Armenians or not. Because in Russian maps, we can see that it's part of the the territory which is controlled or protected by Russians. But in the Azeri maps, we see that there are um, it's an Azeri territory, and Azeris are already there. So in in the streets of my city. So this is the and the government till this day, not the uh, uh, the Artsakh government, neither the Armenian government. They haven't uh, done any comment on this, and this is a real problem that people still think that okay. If I can go to Stepanakert, then nothing serious happened. Okay, some regions are being controlled by Azerbaijanis. Oh, Dadivank is being controlled by Azerbaijan. Okay, but still, till this day, when there was a footage of uh, Azerbaijani troops uh, uh, leaving the sh- Shushi, and they were changing their caste for a couple of hours, people... Uh, we're trying to s- find there some hope, and ah, Azeris are leaving the city, so it's it's under our control. It's Shushi is not, uh, it, uh, it it's still our in uh, in our territory. So this is the and, and gov- government says nothing again. So this is a clear problem of communication, and people are um, uh, still think that there there is there isn't any catastrophe there. So this is we should be praying. Yeah, I call this Arturism, or, you know, people are still living in Artun uh, Humanistan's world. <laughs> or... <laughs> it's not only that. It's not only that. I think as much as Armenia was not prepared for this for or war militarily, also these issues of uh, borders and uh, agreements and so on, these are some things that actually the Russians and the Azerbaijanis have pre- uh, probably prepared for a while. It's about the denial of, uh, you know, a second plan or a, re- a rescue plan or a, a backup plan that Armenia doesn't have. Azerbaijan, unfortunately, Armenia at least had 20 more days, 20 plus days to be part of this process. But still, even with Sunik, I'm not talking about Sotk because, yeah, there were little time and Armenian gov. I'm not, and it's clear to put, not Armenia is ready, but Armenian current government is not ready for this. And well, when I say Armenia, that's what I meant. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, because because there are, there are, a lot of people here in Armenia that can probably do better than than this government. Absolutely right. I'm more than sure in this. But still, I mean, even in 20, 25 days, they haven't prepared anything for Sunik, which is, uh, you can imagine how important Sunik is. And uh, the the people who lives there, they, uh, for example, in Goris or in Khanzoresk, uh, people uh, lost everything which uh, was part of their uh, economic ecosystem. And right. uh, they were not, they uh, have anybody to talk with. This is the most important problem. Like in several regions, I have, after the after this uh, 10th November, November declaration, I have traveled to Goris and to Stepanakert and have seen no signs of Armenian government even in Goris. No signs of Armenian government. This is a terrible situation. And this is clearly because government is in... V- it it can do let's say uh, anything with this because of incompetence. Yeah, going back to Ovik's question, uh, I think one of the things as to what can they offer, the opposition can offer. I don't think at this point they have a they have an, any uh, any option or any any idea of what to have uh, what they can offer. I mean, initially, yeah, don't forget. Initially, one of the first things is that no, we are not going to accept these. Uh, sort of uh, disagreement, the signature, we need to change it. But then uh, when they got the message from Moscow, uh, where President Putin actually mentioned that, you know, anyone who thinks that they can change since start a war are very, very mistaken. You know, they changed their tune. It's more reactive rather than a very proactive thing. Now, there are no guarantees uh, that uh, they are going to be more competent or they are going to be more sort of uh, uh, assertive in all those issues that mentioned, especially uh, by Varujan now. Uh, but I think that is the absence of real alternative. Uh, uh, demanding the, of the uh, Just demanding the government's resignation is not necessarily a, a constructive sort of path. I'm not saying that he should stay. No one is arguing about that. But there is, there doesn't seem to be a clear plan. Whoever the alternative would be, 
I'm careful not to say there is no alternative because that's not the case, but no one has put forward a, a cohesive action plan, a roadmap of what are the things that need to be done. Well, uh, let me disagree with that because uh, the opposition is not only those who are standing at, uh, at in, in the front, but also there are a lot of groups of and initiative groups by different people, by different uh, from different circles, yeah, and from the diaspora as well, which can bring their expertise and their capabilities and their experience to, for example, change the uh, situation uh, with with Bedzor city with Lachi. Uh, which is clearly, uh, even on the paper, it says that there should be two and a half uh, kilometers from each side of the road, which means that the uh, majority, uh, the most part of the city can be uh, uh, under Armenian control or Armenian slash Russian control. But as there is no, as I said, there is no Armenian government taking part in the negotiations, then we lost even uh, uh, we lose this opportunity for now. But Habarujan, uh, the question is yeah. not. They could have an army of Einsteins behind them. I, I don't care. There is no clear articulation. If they're articulating, saying that, oh, uh, we want the government to resign, we're going to have a more active foreign policy, we're going to join an alliance, anti-Turkish alliance, and so on, this is not a, a policy statement. Aspet, let me let me clarify. When you said that they are, I don't really understand uh, whom you are talking about. Because the president, for example, of Armenia, Armen Sarkisian, uh, during the meeting with, with Intelligentsia one week or two weeks ago, he said, and he showed a uh, uh, huge, um, uh, like this kind of a report of what we can do. And he said, like, this is, guys, what I have prepared with my administration and with my friends, etc. So I'm ready to discuss, even with the current government, uh, what we can do. And there is a clear roadmap what steps we should take to change the situation in the parts where we can change. So when you are saying that they are not, I don't really understand. I am not part of this. Uh, the, the opposition, Abarujan. I'm saying the opposition in the 17 plus. In their statements, they never even endorse President Sarkisian roadmap. They're no, this, you are not right. You are not right because Artur Vanetsan and his party said two weeks ago, he said, we are joining Mr. President and his roadmap to, uh, to change to solve this, the crisis in the country. So this is one example. And this is uh, your, in a way, your perspective is part of the general, uh, let's, I'm not, I don't want to use the word manipulation, but it's, it's really part of manipulation because, um, uh, in, in the, in a, in a, in a range of 17 parties, there are parties which, uh, there are people who says that I know how to rebuild the economy. And, uh, for example, our Menge Borkan, former deputy prime minister, a very competent and experienced person. And nobody can say nothing about his competence. Absolutely nobody. And he uh, wrote several public, even open editorials and says that in this part, we can do this. In this part, we can do this. In this part, we can do this. And nobody cares about it because the unfortunate, again, I'm saying this uh, with very... Uh, Mm, uh, with a story that government is still trying to rebuild the situation where there is black and white, old and new, and no uh, possibility to talk about real problems. Still, people are, uh, they are manipulating. Can we just agree, I think, that we are not seeing the Pashinyan government there doing something? I mean, that would give us any confidence that Yes, they are negotiating on our behalf. I mean, and like I said last week, I mean, he's uh, so far the, the biggest thing that someone sees when we look at the actions of the Pashinyan government is trying to justify uh, why it was not fully their responsibility to, to you know, or, or their, their uh, fault to lose the war. But but nothing about, you know, no action, even things like returning the, uh, the POWs or uh, negotiations around that. Uh, so that's my biggest question: is you know, if if that if that inactivity, in a, but so if that if that inactivity it translates to all the other aspects that we're talking about. Someone said on on their Facebook, well, well, like even a brick can do a better job than Pashinyan at this point. I'm sorry that I have to say that. But. Yes, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that you do, you have to bring a brick. My argument is of that course two not. weeks of ago, not, true, but... Vanetian is that did that, but the landscape, the political landscape, is shifting quite fast. 
and now suddenly Vasquez Manukian is, is is the leader. Do, does anyone uh, that has has Vasquez Manukian mentioned anything about the roadmap? Is there any guarantee that you have a prime minister who's going to do that? Yes, a brick would do that. I understand. Uh, Aspet, just the fact that there is no guarantee, it does not mean that we should not, or at least in my opinion, that doesn't mean that the opposition and the people following these protests. Their, their efforts should be devalued. I mean, let's give, you know, why not give them a chance? Did anyone talk about devaluation? I'm arguing for, again, you are not, probably I'm not making it clear. I am saying there should be government change. But if I'm going to change, if I'm going to follow anyone, I need to have at least five, six points to tell me, articulate it. And they could have done this very simply yes, in the yesterday's rally that economically, this is what we want to do. I'm not going to go back. People get her there. They're not going to go back and look at what this or that person said, or there's a, an army of experts behind it. But instead of that, the articulation, the, the level of the articulation the of the discourse is quite weak. I'm not saying there's not going to be a change, but that doesn't instill me with hope. I'm not dismissing it. Well, all I'm saying is a lot of Pashinyan supporters, and I'm not saying you are one, but a lot of people against the current 17 plus are using fear, uncertainty. Uh, what if, you know, he's worse? He doesn't show any good. Uh, well, there is you know, fear and uncertainty time. already. No one would argue about that. I think that wouldn't change. But if you're using fear and uncertainty to say that these people don't have a right to, to come and protest or to challenge. Okay, Hovik, you're putting words in my mouth. Again, let me be clear. These people, they haven't articulated a clear 6.1 liner. If you want to get to know more about the economy, please see our statement here. If you want to know about how are we going to negotiate, this is our diplomatic thing. Declaring, declaring. May I that. agree? May I agree and disagree with Aspet? Uh, because he's right in a way, and in a way he's uh, not not right. I'm sorry, Aspet, to say this. Oh, but right you're, or you're, not right in your opinion, of course. Go yeah, ahead. in my opinion, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the problem is, of course, that there the, the low the the level of the political discourse and discussions in Armenia is absolutely beneath the floor. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And I agree that the opposition is um, playing in the frames of this uh, low-level uh, discussions. The, so they are not uh, showing something that I would like to vote for or anybody who is uh, caring about Armenia uh, should vote for. You are absolutely right in this. But the problem is that the political landscape is first of all the re responsibility of the current government. And if you are starting with the 10th of November, you are, instead of creating the atmosphere where everybody can talk, you are still trying to bring the, the point that you are the only one who, is, who has nothing to do with this. And you are right. And so this, in, with this, you are not um, uh, doing favor for your country, but you are instead polarizing the, the, the society. And because of this polarization, the level of political discourse is going down. And unfortunately, our opposition, which is our opposition, we have nothing else. This opposition is playing with the same instruments which Pashinyan used before to come to power and to keep the power. This is the real problem we have right now. And because of this, many people are not even trying to dig and to understand what kind of prog programs, for example, those who can be part of this new government or the government of national unity can say, as I said, Armen uh, Gevorkian, for example, Shahen Avakian, Armen Sarkisian and many other people who has at least more experience than those who are in the current team. And this is I'm saying with very, like I'm confident in what I'm saying because many of the uh, the new team, or, or the, the team of government, uh, the Pashinyan's government are those who I know from the university years and from work experience, etc., etc. So these people are not co incompetent at all. And now in this difficult situation, it is nearly impossible for these people to do anything. And those who are standing there or those who are bringing their voice and Vazgen Manukyan himself, I'm not, like, right now I'm not protecting him. He's not my candidate. But still, I can say that he is much more uh, competent in understanding what, his system, uh, what, what the system is, state system, state mechanism, state machine, etc. 
than anybody right now in the Pashinyan's government. And the last, the last point, uh, I'm not even talking about the fact that for the national unity, the current govern, governing uh, government and uh, national assembly, which is actually, according to law, is the core of our country, of our state system, can say to their own leader that, man, you were not right, you failed, and for, in, for, for the national unity, you should go, but be part of our party, be the leader of our party. But we should bring another person. Who says that Pashinyan is the best one? No, even from the govern, uh, ruling team. There are plenty of people in the ruling team which can be new prime minister to provide this new atmosphere, to uh, uh, downgrade the, the polarization, which is growing with each post, with each Facebook status of anybody from the current government. Because I went to, as I said, I went to Opera yesterday and I came back. I wrote from one of, one of the uh, members of parliament that those who were there, they were people who got money to be there and to protest us. This is incredible. Well, as you said, Varujan, it is the same uh, tactic that uh, the current government, the Pashinyan movement, used two and a half years ago with the same sort of rehashed uh, statements uh, made there. Uh, So I think that's one of the things. And in terms of a way out, even if the martial law is not removed, would that be available or would it be possible for, for instance, forming a government that would include, let's say, Vaske Manugyan and others as well, but including, uh, you know, either Pashinyan or other people. Now, the question is, it's also a clash of egos. One thing that we don't realize, it's beyond, uh, you know, supporting or opposing Pashinyan is the level of the egos that exist now and uncompromising situation. All right, let's try to get one more question in and then uh, and then we can wrap up. Uh, sorry, asked if 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 I, I if my things weren't very clear clear, but yeah, I, I was not accusing okay. you, but in general, what I wanted to cover is Robert Kocharian's interview yesterday. He spoke about an hour and a half. It was lengthy, but and I, I wanted to see if any of you had any thoughts about the interview. If you've seen it, you know, I have myself like a list of some some of the points uh, of interest that he raised, but I wanted to see what your thoughts are so far, uh, and then maybe we can dive into a few details. Varujan, you want to go first? Um, I have, of course, I have watched the, the interview. Uh, well, um, I haven't seen any any new thing about the situation which I have seen myself in Stepanakir during the first ten days of the war. So, I mean, there is nothing new thing for for me to to talk about. Like, frankly, I think uh, there, there, it was lengthy. It was a very lengthy and exhaustive sort of and exhausting interview. Uh, It was basically a rebuttal uh, to a large extent of some of the things that Pashinyan has mentioned. Uh, And I think um, without saying it, without too many words, he actually, uh, Kocharian, was trying to, um, you know, prepare the ground for people, for his or his team or people in his team to come back. I think a couple of things that stood out for me was the issue that Uh, In retrospect, again, it's so easy in hindsight, right, to uh, argue about things, but he did mention that the July war uh, was instigated by Armenia and that Armenia was not ready for a war, but uh, they could have, uh, you know, they could have postponed it. Um, He did, in a way, uh, bypass the issue of Shushi. Uh, if it was handed over or it was occupied. He uh, insinuated it, but he didn't go into a lot of details. Um, Again, I'm not reading too much into it. I'm not uh, assigning any conspiratorial theory about it. It's just what my reading of what he said, my understanding of what he said. Well, Asped, I think uh, Robert Kocharian also clearly said that Shushi was never in question before. No, I'm not talking about the question, uh, Asped. I'm talking about the occupation of Shushi. I'm not talking about the status of Shushi. Okay. Uh, um, so when it, it when it came to that, I think it was a bit far fetched things that uh, he had argued that had he had he been in power, Azerbaijan would not have dared to start a war. I think that is a bit far fetched. One thing I would agree, though, is that he wouldn't have pushed uh, Azerbaijan and poked Azerbaijan the way Pashinyan did. Uh, but he didn't say it like that. He's trying to come across as the strong person, the, the strong military leader. And he did provide some interesting facts about the Armenian military presence in, in Gharapa, where he argued that most of the troops were situated, were positioned in the north, and were not uh, removed or reshuffled so that they would be engaging Azerbaijani advances in the south. So all in all, I think this is very similar to some of the statements that he did 
uh, or some of the uh, interviews that he gave. He's coming across as the leader, as the the successful leader uh, uh, in terms of um, um, the the archetype of a leader, the stere- the, the stereotype or the profile of a, a what a leader should be. Um, and from that point on, I think everything else was a, more or less a rebuttal of uh, what Pashinyan has mentioned in his uh, numerous Facebook posts and so on. Do you think that he has a chance to sort of contend with uh, or be, uh, contend for the position of prime minister? In- he's not. In- I don't think he's interested. I don't think yeah. he's interested. But that doesn't mean that that he doesn't want his uh, team or people that at least he can have some uh, room to negotiate with or get a message across there. And by doing so, by appearing as a statesman, he would be uh, in a better position to do so. Yeah. The other point that he raised uh, was, it's been much discussed, but the the purchase of the Su-30 airplanes, which altogether so far has cost Armenia $130 million. And he mentioned that that expense was made in lieu of the Tor air defense systems that Armenia could have purchased. This has been an argument that's been made frequently, but it's interesting that uh, he also subscribed to that. Right. No, it's not a matter of subscription, Ovik. You know, this is like, again, in hindsight, it's really, really interesting. It would be fascinating for me to have had an interview with uh, with Kocharyan and say, uh, is Armenia buying Su-30s uh, or uh, anything else? You know, how do you see it in this context and so on? Uh, I'm not sure to what extent he had thought the same thing. This is the problem with social sciences or any political analysis, right? But Asped, can I can I come in for a second? I think uh, Kocharyan also clearly said that uh, uh, Pashinyan explicitly overrode his advisors, his military advisors, in selecting the SU-30s over the TOR systems. Right, right. But uh, that's also that's something we found out now. That's also something we found out now. Unless he has inner knowledge and why didn't he bring it up then uh but regardless i mean the details okay, we can go into a lot of details but i don't think uh it's relevant at this point it's just a matter of what does it mean his interview now rather than the content it's more about as i th- i think it's more about appearing as to be uh you know the statesman uh, who was successful uh in his own words and in terms of looking at the track record how, however you look at it uh and um, basically being part of the the opposition without actually being part of the opposition yes i i just like to add that when you say that we all have 2020 hindsight now and why didn't he speak back then well, you want to leave the government to uh, do its business, but our 2020 hindsight now includes a catastrophic defeat, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So hence, more the, uh, more sort of uh, meat to sort of uh, mince and uh, more information to mince. Okay, well, and last topic before we leave, uh, short, uh, very quickly. Uh, on December 2, uh, Russian President Putin chaired a virtual summit of the CSTO. And uh, announcing that Armenia's leader has to make uh, painful but necessary concessions, Putin said that it was up to the CSTO leaders to support the prime minister as well as his team in their effort to establish peace, achieve the implementation of all decisions made, and assist people who found themselves in a very difficult life situation. A lot of people interpreted this as an explicit support uh, of Pashinyan uh, by Moscow. Um, But... You know, uh, on the sidelines of that, uh, a few other things that happened is several uh, wealthy Russian Armenian diasporans uh, called for his resignation, for, for Nikol Pashinyan's resignation, or joined the, the call for his resignation, including Ruben Vartanyan and Samvel Karapetyan, uh, who are frequently mentioned uh, to be very close to the Russian government. So, Aspet Kochikyan or uh, Varujan, does Pashinyan have support from Russia? I think Pashinyan is actually the the perfect sort of candidate for Russia to be able to exercise its control over Armenia. Now that our that now that Pashinyan is more reliant on on Russia, uh, Russia would prefer to see Pashinyan stay in power because they would have they have all the leverages they need and they want to uh, exercise pressure on Armenia. Uh, with a uh, with a change of government, with a an unknown, whoever that might be, Marukian or uh, Vaske Manukian or an X or a Y or a Z, uh, I think uh, Russia would have to um, restate and reassert itself uh, by whatever means possible to say that you need to follow what I uh, what I'm, I'm telling you. And at this point, Pashinyan doesn't have any option but to follow. Perhaps more so now because Pashinyan also feels that it's 
his basically continuation, uh, his power or his authority uh, would be is, is completely dependent on Putin's support. Would you concur with that, Farijan? Uh, well, uh, in a way, yes. Uh, I would like also. I would bring only one one more argument to what Aspet said. Um, it is clear that this is a part of the uh, announcement and the declaration of 10 of November. The support to to Pashinyan for another I don't know month or two. Uh, but if we see what kind of atmosphere is created towards Pashinyan in the Russian elite. And when I'm saying Russian elite, I mean all the circles and all the towers, as it as we used to say about the Russian elite, the, all the towers of Kremlin, they are absolutely anti anti Pashinyan, and uh, they are absolutely preparing his resignation as well from the Russian side. Uh, why? For now, for this, uh, for for this moment, very moment, uh, Putin is declaring that Pashinyan is a good man. Uh, this is a, of, of, I, I think that it's clear for us. It means that uh, there are some other uh, things which should be done. Uh, which are part of the uh, back office of the 10th November declaration. Uh, I don't know the details, of course, uh, but the, the the logic of the uh, of the way that Putin is, let's say, playing with Pashinyan, is uh, clear for me. Okay, I think we have to leave it at that, and uh, we can guess as to what what's going on behind the scenes. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. It was a heated discussion, but it was a very interesting one. Thank you, Ovik. Thank you, Ovik. Thank you, Varujan. Heated discussions are the best ones. Thank you, Aspen. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Ovik. And that concludes our program for this episode of Groom Weekend Review. We hope it has helped your understanding of some of the issues from this previous week. We look forward to your feedback and suggestions for issues to cover in greater depth. Contact us on our website at groong.org, that's G-R-O-O-N-G, and on our Facebook page, A-N-N-Groong, or in our Facebook group, Groong-Armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. I'm Hovik Manacharyan, and on behalf of everyone in this episode, I wish you a good week. Thank you for listening, and talk to you next week. 